podcast the pokemon podcast revolves around the evolving meta episode 168 i think i'm pretty sure this is episode 168 whatever it is <laughs> in the title card that you see thank you for joining us i'm jake that's sean sean how are you doing i'm good i'm good jake i think uh we're switching places this week you were able to watch some pokemon over the weekend and i did not so yeah I got to watch a little bit of the San Antonio Originals, which is going to be the bulk of what we're talking about today with news being slow going through the holidays. I feel like news has always been kind of slow leading up to like Christmas and stuff in the couple years that we've done this. I'd have to actually look back and see if that's <laughs> 100% true. But uh, through my travels that I've been doing, because audio and visual uh, watchers and listeners may know that I'm actually not in the uh, same place, same studio, almost. Uh, just doing some traveling and stuff for the holidays. So, But we've still got some great stuff for you. Uh, the San Antonio Regionals, I thought, was actually really, really cool. Um, and something that I think it would probably be better to talk more in the future, rather than you know, just the stint right now, especially like once the season ends or rotation and stuff. But it was really cool watching the championships because a lot of games just felt really, really close, I Mm. will say. And one thing is like, Sean and I kind of talked about this before, but like a couple years ago, you know, and through the last couple years, the format has really felt like a, you win on turn one, Kind of deal, mm-hmm. not necessarily like a donk um, or like whatever, but it really feels like you won or lost on the first turn of the game. Um, yeah. But if you haven't watched San Antonio, highly encourage watching the VOD, you know, um, or VODZA because it was two days, you know, watching those games because especially when you got to top cut, it fell back and forth the whole way. You didn't know who was going to win until like kind of the last moments. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of comeback. Um, and not in comeback that is like a reset stamp or something like that. Like these direct cards, it was like a combination of things and tactics and like card play that really, uh, propelled that idea or propelled that kind of style forward. So it was really, really cool to watch. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, I know that the designers, when they talked about the game and like, we we may have talked about this on the pod, but a big focus for them in the Scarlet and Violet era, which we're really seeing come into its own, is the idea of the comeback. So they've, you know, introducing cards like Countercatcher and Reversal Energy, um, Iono, mm-hmm. just a whole range of cards and Defiance Band. I don't know if anybody, I think Charizard lists, some of them play it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like just cards like that. A- I think there was another Defiance thing that we'll talk about in the top eight list. I think I remember which list it was from. Okay. But a couple of cards that we haven't talked about yet on this podcast. But yeah. At least but, the tournament results that help. But just stuff like that being like, okay, it was a clear impetus for them to be like, hey, it seems like if you go first in this game right now, you tend to just win because you're going to, you know, it's going to be an even prize trade, most likely for most decks. And then so whoever mm-hmm. goes first wins. So it's like, okay, well, let's have comeback mechanics. And like, you can mess with your opponent's game plan. And just seems to be, it seems to be working. Like, like you said, like, it's mm-hmm. cool to be able to start a match, have one opponent or both opponents do well and not immediately know, oh, well, their path to victory is just so clear. I don't see how they lose. It was one of those things that the final game of the tournament and the championship finals we won't say who won yet because we'll talk about their decks later um but like it at first i thought one player was going to win but then it came back at the very end and it came down to a final moment a final like action that you know had to be like judge shuffled because of you know like i'm not going to make the cut that you know like gives you the win (laughs) You know, leaving it up to the hands of the judges. So, like, that's how that's just how cool it was. I think San Antonio, you know, being a 1900 person event, almost 2000, 1985 in terms of the exact number of masters, I just thought it was an incredible uh, 
regional to watch. And I'm actually going to probably watch more later in terms of like previous rounds and stuff like that, just to like, you know, enjoy. Cause there was a ton of cool lists. There was a ton of cool innovations and stuff, meta decisions and things like that, that I wouldn't have predicted um, some choices that we'll kind of talk about in the podcast today. Well, I mean, we could jump into it, Jake. Do you want to just jump into San Antonio? Do you, do you want to jump into I top mean, I eight? Guess we should. Yeah, yeah, we could we could do it. Do you want to get into top eight, or do you want me to go to like the statistics page or whatever? Let's do statistics. Let's talk about kind of the days themselves. Okay. Um, On Limitless, they only what, have top eight, but if you have the numbers for conversion I rates, I have Pokey Stats Live, which I'll kind of talk about and send to you as I'm talking about it to make sure we both have it. So in day one, and you may have seen this go around on Twitter because Pokemon puts out graphics of like the metagame breakdown in terms of the decks. Day one, 20% Charizard, which is very, very interesting because we've seen the last couple of weeks, you know, a very, very even percentage of several decks at like 15, 14, 13, stuff like that in terms of percentages all right next to each other, very even meta. But now we've kind of seen this flow towards Charizard. Ahead of the game, 5% to Maridon Flappy sitting at 15. And then Giratina V-Star Lost Zone over at 10, the top three decks. Um, and then three decks in percentage. Gardevoir going down under 10% is really, really cool to see also in terms of the day one meta. Yeah. I mean, I, I we said it at the beginning of this set that Gardevoir should be in a great position to single prize focus deck, but in reality, I, I you know, I'm not saying it's a bad deck, but and having played it myself, I don't know what it is with Gardevoir, but it feels like either everything runs smoothly or like something goes amiss in like your the, the sequence of, you know, that you get the cards you need. And you just aren't able to close it out. Maybe it's just a deck that relies too much on combo pieces. Um, I think it's not only that. It's because if you look at the decks going on right now with uh, Charizard and just kind of some Lost Zone decks in general, you know, this this mm -hmm. movement towards like stopping Guard of War has been really preventative from a lot of people, one, wanting to play Gardevoir, but two, I think in general, like, Gardevoir takes a lot of time. Yeah. I think one of the, I think one of the not spoken reasons is you have to be, like, toward level of confident in your game plan and being able to, you know, play the clock and stuff like that, and it's all fairness, you know, within the rules of the game. Like, you have to be really quick and you have to be really spotty uh, with your decisions or on the spot with your decisions with Gardevoir to be able to play that deck, especially, you know, when you talk about just through day one, uh, nine rounds, and that doesn't even get into day two and top cut and things like that. If you're lucky enough well, let's uh, look to at, be able to do that. Let's look at the day two conversion then in terms of, mm -hmm. which is the third in the drop down on pokey stats, which is uh, of the decks that play, like what percent of each of them, did really well and um i think you continue to see like giratina v star lost zone it's just a really solid deck it was what number two overall in day one and then number one mm -hmm. in the conversion rate um mew despite being played a little bit less in day one still had i mean look it's mew's not gonna go anywhere until the day it rotates it's just great it's just a good deck Mm -hmm. especially um, if you've been playing it a long time and the breakdown that i think you have shown right now i think this is also interesting to note they break it down between fusion mew and not fusion mew mm -hmm. so like double turbo mew exclusive and then fusion strike double turbo mew um those are both at 18 and a half or a little bit higher percent so really like mew in itself mew the archetype Mew VMAX and Genesect V pretty much has like a quick math, like 37% conversion. Well, I don't think that's actually how math works, but they had two <laughs> decks that were within the top. That did really well. That converted. So I think that, I think that just speaks to the volume of like 
sure, maybe not a lot of people are playing Mew VMAX, but the people that are playing Mew VMAX really know how to play Mew VMAX. And it's like the Colin Merrill Matthews out there that just like, they've been playing it so much, they know the matchups, they don't have to relearn their deck every single tournament, and and they just excel with it. So, I, like you said, you know, Mew's not going away until it dies yeah. um, or <laughs> rotates. Um, yeah. So, like, if you're comfortable playing Mew, just play Mew. <laughs> And then Charizard EX rounding out the top five in conversion rate. Very solid, 16%. Mm. Like, if the more people play it, the more likely you are to have players that, to be frank, are, like, less experienced or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, There's just more room for more of those people to, like, do poorly. And so having a top five conversion rate within that, even as the highest most played deck, is really good. So... Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. when you look at just the day two metagame in general, Charizard shooting up from 20% in day one to 23% in day two. So a lot of the smaller, not popular decks just kind of falling off, I feel like, because Garatine is still sitting around like the 15 and Inteleon, VMAX, Urshifu sitting at just under 10. So a lot of like your, you know, La Sente, Valiant, Palkia decks, you know, stuff like that a lot of the smaller decks just kind of falling off in the day two conversion and just bumping up Charizard even more. So that's the breakdown. Now, now I think we can get into the top eight spoilers for anybody who uh, might be interested in watching the VOD. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Charizard on top, you know, all, all throughout the tournament, day one percentage, day two percentage. And then with Azul, GG, taking that top spot with Charizard. Azul Garcia Griego getting his sixth regional win. I think he's he's either one or two regional championships away from tying Michael mm-hmm. Pramwat, who I think holds the title as most regional wins ever in Pokemon history. Um, I think I heard that somewhere. That could be right or wrong. But it, it, either way, six is very, very good. Piloting for Team uh, CGC, Charizard, and Pidgeot. So if you pull up his list, very, very interesting list, I will say what I thought and what is the most interesting part of this deck. So if you watch like his little stream and stuff, he kind of mentioned at one point when he was first testing like Charizard EX, he was like, man, Justified Gloves is really, really good. Sean, I don't think we've talked about Justified Gloves yet on this podcast, have we? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Um, I don't know. So we'll talk about this real quick then. Justified Gloves, it is a one of card in the list, and you've probably got it in your Chilling Rain bulk. It is a tool card. It's a tool card that the Pokemon or the attacks this Pokemon, this card is attached to, do 30 more damage to your opponent's active dark Pokemon. So when you talk about this in a Charizard EX deck, this is huge in the mirror match, which at the rates that we talked about with Charizard, mirror matches are uh, probably something that you face multiple times in a single day. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's great because the plan, I think, for a lot of those decks is to I think leave your opponent at two prizes Mm -hmm. while going in with your own Charizard or something like that. I don't know. I'm sure there's like a math reason why like, you know, to knock out an opposing Charizard, you usually have to be on, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, one prize left and then you could do 330 and and then you're fine. Right. But if you're sort of even on two prizes and neither player can knock the other one out, then you're like, ah, I don't want to take one prize and then, you know, open my opponent up to just, you know, response KO me. And Justified Govs Mm -hmm. gets around the problem that Defiance Band has, which is, if you're even on prizes, Defiance Band does nothing. So. The Charizard EX, for anyone who doesn't know, it is 180 base damage and then 30 more for each prize your opponent has taken. So like Sean was saying, you know, when you're at two prizes left, Charizard hitting for 300 damage normally. So the Justified Gloves in a mirror match makes it to 230 on a Charizard EX, which takes that one-hit KO, which, you know, obviously could win you the game. 
Another thing on here, too, is especially in the mirror match, we've seen a lot of decks, uh, especially in the top four, his teammate playing the exact same 60, Grant Manley, was also in there. And I think just Charizard EX in general is pretty much always going to play the Pidgeot version, what we've seen. So there's another tool card in here that boosts up damage that was really, really critical in Vitality Band. John... Vitality Band tool card in Scarlet and Violet base set. Card is attached to do 10 more damage to your opponent's active Pokemon. So 10 damage, really, really good for specific numbers, especially your smaller Pokemon like Rotom V, right? Rotom V sitting at 190. I think also Genesect V is yep. 190. So you're burning darkness at the beginning of the game can knock out a lot of these uh, smaller Pokemon. And then I'm trying to do the quick math. Uh, three, so if your opponent has taken three what? prizes, right, that's 90 damage to do 270 with a Vitality Band as well on that three prize turn, you can gust up a Pidgeot with 280, 280 HP and take that knockout. And... One thing that's also really cool for the mirror match type thing, you see these one of uh, tool cards in Vitality Band, Justified Gloves for Steelstone. You're definitely playing four Arvins, an entire playset of Arvins in this one. Yeah, another another matchup. So say you go first mm -hmm. against Maridon. Maridon gets a cheeky oh, yeah. a cheeky one prize. Oh, now you're at two ten. Well, Maridon's two twenty. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Oh, just let me just let me just slap that Vitality Band on there. Do two twenty. <clears throat> you so, have a lot of Pokemon. You have a lot of Pokemon in this list that could be one hit KO'd. You know, because your Charmanders early, you know, need to evolve. Same with your Pidgeys, but you also have the Mysterious Tail Mew, the Battle VIP Pathfinder, or you know, Ultra Ball Rare Candy it has a lot of great uses. And you've also got like Manaphy and Jirachi in there. Jirachi to stop the uh, uh, Sableye Lost Zone Sableye attacks, which we talked about the other week. Is it now the time to put save or the time to put Jirachi in your decks? You remember we had that we had that talk after Sablezard yeah. one, so you can now confirm that everybody listens to the Metapod <laughs> podcast because there is the uh, there's the advice on uh, that one. But very very cool. This this is also in my opinion somewhat greedy in terms of the gusting, which worked out really really well. In a lot of situations, this list playing three bosses orders and two counter catchers. A lot of times, I think prior to this, and I think um, I think it was Trainer Chip that was explaining it on the cast before this event. We've seen a lot of Charizard lists play like a two-two split, or you know, a two-one or a three-one split in terms of the gusting um, effects and different cards that you can have. So. 3-2 in here, really geared towards bossing up and really utilizing the things like the Justify Gloves, Vitality Band, you know, at the exact moments that you want to do them. So then you don't hit right into a Pokemon in two-shot, you know, when you're not going to win the two-shot trade with your Charizard VMAX. So really, really interesting to see this list. Really, really cool that they cooked up Grant and Azul, and I think Caleb Gittimer probably did too on this list so i mean i i loved it yeah i i will say like i know we got a comment last week on last mm -hmm. week's episode yeah I, I was saying that like uh charizard we said it was mid before i think that's largely because mm -hmm. it has a very linear gameplay and that usually holds decks back you know like a deck may be uh just not quite you know yeah, and, and it's not very versatile. Like, you know, yeah. yeah, you know what it's going to do, and so you can kind of plan around it as an opponent to be able to prevent um, stuff like that happening. Like, if you saw a lot of matchups um, of Charizard, it was very often in the streams that, you know, people would say, like, as soon as Pidgeot EX goes down, the game plan for Charizard just falls apart, and it crumbles almost immediately once Pidgeot goes down. So, yeah. Continue yeah. on, Sean. <laughs> no, so and it's interesting to me that Azul has uh, taken Radiant Charizard out of this list, which mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, if you want to hit, um, if you want to put your opponent in a 
one prize issue, right? And like, hey, you know, instead of giving up a two prizer to end the game, I'll just throw up a one prizer, make you go through it for a, for another turn, force you to have a boss. Um, but I suppose since Roaring Moon especially is not particularly relevant, um, what's knocking out a Charizard EX other than a an opposing Charizard EX, right? So I, I guess maybe there's just less fear of like putting that Charizard in the active, being like, well, you probably can't knock it out anyways. So mm-hmm. the I'm only fine. thing that really can, aside from like a literal grass counter, you yeah. know, Pokemon, I believe is just Giratina V V Star with the Lost Requiem uh, V Star attack, which can only be used once in a game. So. Yeah, that that would be a situation in which you'd be like, oh, you know, maybe. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it may be that Charizard, the way that they play that, is they just constantly boss up your Giratinas so that you don't have any setup. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, I don't know. It's it's interesting, though. Yeah, it's really cool in general that you pointed out that there is no Radiant Charizard in here. There's no Radiant at all. And I think it's not very often that we see decks that don't have a Radiant at all. I mean, we even saw Reggie Gigas decks, you know, for a short time <laughs> playing the Jirachi, the Radiant Jirachi. Um, so really, really cool, I would say, to not have any of that at all. I think that's interesting. I didn't notice that until right now. I will say, if we're not going to run Radiant Charizard, maybe this is a bad idea. And people on YouTube or, it, you know, whatever social platform, let me know. But Radiant Jirachi is really good when it works i think like (laughs) i think i mean you're right you're right about that it is really really good when it works but i think the problem with it is it just doesn't work enough right you're probably right there's too many there's too many escape ropes there's too many bosses there's Countercatcher even now, which I don't know if Countercatcher would really matter because you'd probably only use Jirachi at the very, very beginning of the game. Yeah. But I think it's just like it's too risky being a liability, like a, a bench space, especially when you talk about, you know, they need two Charmanders on the field. They need two at least one Pidgey. Or yeah. at yeah, at least, at least one, one. two. You got a man heavy yeah, there's a heavy part of the meta where, you know, where you are worried about Greninja. There's another part of the meta where you're worried about Sableye, right, with the Jirachi. And then mm-hmm. very, very often I notice these Charizard decks playing the Rotom early and using Rotom's uh, draw engine turn one um, to be able to stack up your hand. So I guess it's, that's it's already like a pretty full bench. That's sort of my, that would be the thing that I would consider switching. And it's probably a bad call. I'm just going to say that. It's probably not good. But it's definitely one where like, hmm, you know, like I I would prioritize getting down your Charmander, your Pidgey, and your Manaphy in certain matchups especially. And maybe even getting a Mew out early so that you can find the Battle VIP pass. But if you have the ability to get those out and get the Rotom V out on the same turn, there's a real part of me that goes, you know, if I've got one energy in hand, why don't I just retreat whatever is in the active into that Jirachi mm-hmm. and say, look, I'm going to give up one prize anyways, probably, in a lot of matchups. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, if you knock this out and you don't play a path to the peak down, I'm just going to go get whatever three cards I want versus Rotom says just draw three. And it's like, hey, draw three is not bad, but I don't know. It's just it, there's a part of me that wants to get really greedy. That's all. It's just that there, little part. My question is: My question is, what do you take out then? The Rotom B. That's what I would take out. You're taking so you're taking out the Rotom B in general. You're not just saying Rotom B and Jirachi. No. you know, draw three cards and then get three cards that you want when it's knocked out. Okay, you're because, saying one or the other. Because both of them are turn one only plays, really, right? Mm-hmm. Like Rotom B is a turn one play to get you three extra cards. If you ever use that ability again in the match. Like, you've lost. Right. So, like, okay, it's a one-turn draw three is really what you're saying. And then, so, like, Jirachi is also a one-turn search your deck for three. But either of them, like, I guess the Rotom is harder to mess with because it goes on your bench. But then it's a two-prizer, you know, which I'm kind of like, 
Ah, uh, between like if you two prize Rotom, if you two prize Aluminion as well, and then if you two prize a Pidgeot, you could just go completely around Charizard EX entirely and win the game. So mm-hmm. that's the only thought that I have of like I'm sure you know you can play the match a specific way. Uh, but that's that's the one area where I'm like, hmm. So yeah, we'll see Random if Sean thoughts. ends up <laughs> topping the next regional. Uh, Sean no. topping Charlotte with Radiant Jirachi. I see. Uh, you heard it here <laughs> first. But anyways, that's Azul's list. And again, all the lists that we'll feature on the podcast, um, especially maybe if you can't see the video version, you can check out the description below to our Pokemon.io link. That'll have the deck list that we showcase ready to copy paste into uh, PTCGL or anything like that. But Sean, let's go over the second place deck piloted by Grant Hayes, Garatina V Star. So, this Garatina V Star list, in my opinion, is almost like pretty standard from what we've seen, you know, the Lost Zone package, a 3-3 line of Garatinas with your four coal wrists, um, your spread of energies, right, Psychic Turbo, or I'm sorry, Psychic Jet, Grass, and Water, playing the Path to the Peaks because Garatina doesn't care about Path to the Peak. And it's just really, really strong in the deck that we just showcased that is super reliant on abilities, right? Yeah. A couple things stand out to me with this deck. One of them being the one of Poke Gear. <laughs> hmm. We've seen two of the Poke Gear, but one of Poke Gear does not happen very often, but could be really, really good, right? I mean, you do have very, very good draw with this deck, um, but sometimes, especially if you watched Grant Hayes in the beginning or any time in the finals, I don't, he did not, I don't think there was game where he found Colorus in the first like two turns he used Gertina V's Abyss Abyss Seeking Mm -hmm. really really often it was an incredibly high rate but it proved to be very very strong because he ended up taking that to three games and he competed as I mentioned you know it it was close for a lot of the time so very very cool to see that you don't have to maybe hit Colorus every single turn it just helps out a lot Um, I wonder you're Sorry, I was gonna say the pokey. I was I was thinking about the pokey gear. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm wondering if it's like I guess you don't you're never not happy to see it, right? Yeah. And I'm like I don't maybe it was just an open spot that you're like well I don't really know what else like <laughs> I'll throw a pokey gear and if if it's early game I can grab a colorist and in the late game when your deck is much smaller it's kind mm-hmm. of a, it's an amazing card to find Roxanne or Iono so that you can get the I- Iono path played out. I think it's just really, really good in general because it almost like it almost acts as a fifth Colrus kind of in your deck. And the mentions mm-hmm. that you reasoned in the late game, but like with the deck, you know, constantly flower selecting and conceal carding, you know, things like that. The Poke Gear is just super helpful in finding, you know, your your uh, engine in general, right? Because if you have all four Colrus in the deck and you Poke Gear. There's a pretty decent chance, you know, that you end up finding that card with all of your draw support ability. So just a really, really cool inclusion in general. Like you said, like just had one more spot that they could, you know, fit in and it and it goes because I think we've all been there in the days of like the greens format and the welder format, right? In like 2019, yep. 2018, where um where like pokey gears can eventually be kind of duds, right? If you if yeah. you already have enough welders or greens or really any supporters, Cynthia's, you know, things like that. Pokey gear can be a card that can get old very quickly. Um so really, really nice to just kind of have that one in there. The um but yeah, that was oh, the other thing that actually stood out to me is two rock sand. Instead mm-hmm. of more Iono, they opted for more Roxanne. And I feel like, and I don't think we've really talked about this in the last several weeks, talking about results and stuff, we've seen this trend more towards Iono and less to Roxanne because Roxanne is a dead card for the first half of the game, although a really, really strong card at the end of the game. Um, 
So I thought it was really interesting to go to Roxanne and one Iono instead of the reverse way. You know, two two Ionos and one Roxanne. I just thought that was really, really cool. Yeah, I it may be that yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that Grant has has had or will have games where mm-hmm. they'll be sitting on an early hand going second, and the only supporter in their hand is a Roxanne, and they're like, well, rip. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it, it will happen, but mm-hmm. I, I guess the upside of Roxanne in the late game is like, you get to draw a bunch of cards still, and you're putting mm-hmm. your opponent down to two. Um, whereas Iono is is good in the late game but sometimes it can be as much of a of, of harm it's kind of like judging yourself if you're both at like two or three prizes so i don't know it's uh it is interesting it is interesting but um it's just really really cool especially like as a loss zone deck right because like you mentioned you know the prize trade can get even and kind of sway at times as well and you both could be at that same similar spot so just really really yeah. interesting um to see that split but is there anything else that kind of stands out to you in here i mean i will say not in this deck list in terms of the top Mm -hmm. eight though um looking back at it there are two snorlax decks in the top eight one of them is a snorlax stall it seems i imagine pretty regular the other one is labeled differently um and jake do you want to talk about this snorlax it's is it's still a Snorlax stall deck, right? I'm not going crazy. Are you here. talking about? Are you talking about Hales? Yeah, the eighth place eighth list. Place? Yeah. Okay, so this one is. So we've talked about Snorlax stall and stuff, but this one is a new version, kind of of control stall in general, utilizing Pidgeot EX. You know, Pidgeot we talked about in Charizard's game plan. You know, a lot of people were saying that once you knock out that Pidgeot, the deck just crumbles. And so this deck as well, really utilizing Pidgeot and Quick Search. Quick Search is being effectively a very good ability as we've, you know, more and more talked about, I will say. I think we kind of, you know, downplayed it a little. I will be the first to admit, <laughs> I think I downplayed it a little bit like when we first saw it. But I just, I keep getting more and more impressed with the deck as time goes on. So you've got a lot of different options in here. You've got the safeguard Mimikyu, right? Um, because that wall is just strong. We've seen that through time and time again in different cards like Shining Legends Hoopa and stuff like that just constantly come back. It's got the block Snorlax, not allowing Pokemon to retreat. We've seen that in a bunch of other archetypes. As well as cards like Luxray V, John Luxray V being very, very cool with the Fang Snipe doing 30 damage. Opponent reveals their hand, discard a trainer card you find in there. Could be very, very good for cards that can't be uh, gotten back, especially when you talk about the Charizard decks, things like that. Rare Candy, very, very good card. Trainer cards in general are super important right now in Pokemon, and unless it's like Palpad, It's not really a way to recycle trainer cards, right? So could be really, really good in finding one-ofs, could be really, really good in just, you know, preventing opponents from doing whatever they want anyways. You've also got in there the Spirit Tomb, which uh, just hinders Pokemon, basic Pokemon Vs, so your Genesex, Luminions, things like that. Rotom Vs in your uh, Charizard matches, right? We talked about Rotom and its impact in that deck. And so Spiritomb answers to that. You got a Dunsparce, so your uh, Pidgeot can't get destroyed by Maridon, which I think is also really, really cool, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, because Pidgeot is a normal type in the Pokemon trading card game. So that lightning uh, weakness, you know, when Maridon hits or Raikou hits, um, it's just it's really, really strong. <laughs> yeah, it's just really, really strong. The Mawile as well in here. It's been a while since we talked about the Mawile. Mawile with Tempting Trap. During your opponent's next turn, the defending Pokemon can't retreat. And then during your next turn, the defending Pokemon takes 90 more damage from attacks. I think you're mainly doing this for the retreat purpose. But if you do have an annoying Pokemon in there, they you can go in and you can hit with like 
I don't know, like a, uh, a Fang Snipe for 120 damage, which is a ton, uh, yep. I will say, or really just 100 damage with a double turbo unless you're attaching... Well, actually, you're always going to do that amount of damage uh, with the Tempting <laughs> Trap. But either way, again, mainly for the blocking the retreat. Yep. So really, really cool stuff in terms of Pokemon in here, but there's a lot of interesting uh, trainer cards as well. So in terms of the supporters, there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 different supporters. Is there any that stand out to you? I mean, it's the same ones that we've seen in all the other Snorlax lists. Um, mm -hmm. You've got your run-of-the-mill, like, you've got Arvin, which I think Arvin being more popular in this list makes sense because you're playing Pidgeot. Um, mm -hmm. so that'll get you your rare candy. It'll get you the forest seal stone that you can throw onto one of your V's. And then once you have the Pidgeot up and running, once that's up and running, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need to draw a lot. Like you'll draw with Rotom and then you'll find whatever mm -hmm. singular card you need with Pidgeot on every turn, probably. So the one thing I will say that I, I think is a little interesting as a choice, uh, is Penny. Over mm -hmm. Professor Turo, I think. To be frank, I would. I think I'm. I would almost always play just Professor Turo over Penny because it's the same effect, except it could also work on your Pidgeot. Mm -hmm. Like, is there any reason, Jake, to play Penny over Professor Turo here? I'm trying to look at it's Professor Turo scenario. I'm trying to look at the exact wording on there just to be able to get it it says put well here's the one here's the big difference and so, all cards attached yeah well so penny says yes all cards attached to it but professor turo says put one of your pokemon in play into your hand discard all cards attached to that pokemon so i think that's just the biggest reason between the two is especially when you have the snorlax and stuff with bravery charm right yeah you really want to utilize the bravery charm in a lot of these different cards. You know, the Mawile with the bravery charm gets 140 HP, which is a really awkward number. The Mimikyu getting 120, which can be a, a really interesting number. And even stuff like the Rotom V, right? And Luxray also being basic Pokemon. Um, you're just able to pick up those dudes because you're running all basic Pokemon except Pidgeot. Um, you're able to get those bench sitters and stuff like that out before either they get knocked out or um, when you don't need them anymore per se and still be able to utilize the resources that you may have on them as well. Um, I like that. That's a very good, that's a very good call. Yeah. You also kind of mentioned, you know, not working with Pidgeot, right? And you're right. Penny does not work with Pidgeot, but I think a good reason to not have Turo, aside from the point that I just said, is because you're running a one of Cheryl in this list, Sean. Remember Cheryl? Mm -hmm. It's been a while since we talked about it because it was uh, <laughs> Inteleon, Rapid Striker, Shifu with the Shady Dealings. Cheryl heals all damage onto Evolution Pokemon and then discarding, you know, all cards attached to all it. All the so, energy, yeah. Especially... Yeah, so, or discarding the energy, thank you. So, um, especially with Pidgeot, you know, you can utilize the Cheryl if they're doing, like, you know, Sableye damage to it, you know, trying to get to it, or, you know, you have that Dunsparce in play and a Maridon racks into it, right? Now you can just elongate that Pidgeot just a little bit more in a bunch of different scenarios. So, Really, really cool, different iteration of like Snorlax control that we've seen. I don't think we've really seen a more Pidgeot focused version. Um, we've always just seen, I feel like, or at least have talked about on the podcast, a you know, just Snorlax uh version, which is still uses Snorlax, but you know, it's just it's a little bit more spread in terms of its diversity. But there's one tool card, Sean. <laughs> that I want to talk about in this list. One really, real cool, really, really cool tool card. So we've done, Sean, Defiance mm -hmm. Band in podcast episodes. But if you look through your Paradox Rift bulk, you might find another tool card called Defiance Vest. 
And this one is also really interesting. I really like the addition of this card in list. If you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, the Pokemon this card is attached to takes 40 less damage from attacks from your opponent's Pokemon. Excellent after the first knockout has been taken because this is basically always going to be active in games. Yeah. Uh, Jake, I'm just also letting you know, I turned the camera off on Discord. It seems to fix the problem, so it's Discord that's causing the freezing. Say, you disappeared on me, John. <laughs> I did. I, pulled, I did. And for the listeners, <laughs> we, can, we can tell the listeners this. Yeah, Discord has been giving me issues whenever I do anything that looks like a thumbs up. It, like, mm -hmm. breaks my OBS camera. Anyways. Um, Very interesting. You, yeah, so Defiance Vez. It allows mm -hmm. you to take 40 less damage from attacks from your opponent's Pokemon if you have fewer prize cards remaining. And that 40 uh, less damage is very good. Uh, it's not 50 HP, which is what you would put on, like, what was what Bravery Charm gives you. But 40 mm -hmm. less damage will work on Pidgeot, which is cool. Um, so yeah. You've got protection uh, basically for all your Pokemon in there in some form or fashion. And again... Another reason why I feel like Penny is so strong, because think about, you know, if you can just cycle something like that Defiance Vest throughout the entire game, basically. Uh, very, very cool. I will say, though, especially for Hale in the top <laughs> eight match, got super unlucky. You probably saw the screenshot on Twitter. Prized all three of his rare candy in one of the games. He runs three rare candies in this list. Prized all three of them. Did a Peonia... And off the Peonia did not see a rare candy. That's insane. It's it, that's. I think, and and I can't verify this math because I am awful at math, and I have no, no. idea. But I think <laughs> uh, Wancho, one of the Pokemon TPCI casters, said that that was about like a point three percent chance or something like that. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's correct math. It's very but low. Way, it's an incredibly low percentage to have through all of your rare candies prized, but then also to um, win on PM. Yeah, also miss all of them. So feels bad, man, but that's Pokemon. It does happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, that's that's honestly that's probably it in terms of the list I wanted to talk about. Everything else is pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a Maridon in there in the top eight. There's a Palkia list in the top eight. Um, but, you know, generally, I think it's the big takeaway for me is that we underestimated Charizard going into this format. It's been mm -hmm. it hasn't like won every tournament. It's not, um, in my opinion, it's not an S tier deck. I don't think I think it's a good deck. It's very good. Um, but it's probably been that and Giratina have been the most consistent decks in the format where like every tournament, it's kind of always in the conversation of like some of the best decks Maridon, you could maybe say, is also sometimes like in that conversation, but uh, clearly underestimated in terms of like how good it is and how consistently good it is. Mm -hmm. But Jake, it's just really nice to see the evolution. Oh yeah, um, I guess one last topic because uh, mm -hmm. this is this was the main thing, and then I I prompted Jake with this. I was like, do you want to talk about where we are? We're at halfway through this season the 2023-2024 season for Worlds. And for at least people in North America, U.S. and Canada, um, the CP requirement was raised this year to 600. And there's been a lot of, like, discussion. Is that good? Is it bad? Is it too much? Like, I don't know. Uh, and while we can't know for sure, I wanted to look at some of the numbers uh and compare it and the only comparison we have i'm gonna caveat this we compared it to 2019 because every other year that's available either was cut short because of the pandemic or last season we did not have um cups and challenges so i just wanted to you know give it the most clear comparison in terms of the number of opportunities people had to earn points mm -hmm. And there's so, still like there's still some variance in there, especially when you talk about since the change, you know, like with the pandemic, you know, shops closing and stuff like that. So we don't know the exact number of like new places that have opened up or how many places there are in general to participate in cups, challenges, stuff like that. But also the player base numbers, 
you know, we can just assume that over that time that the Pokemon trading card game community has in general grown um, yep. because of some of the decisions that they've made with like upping the amount of points, right, to qualify for Worlds um, and stuff like that. So there's always going to be those kind of like points of information that we're not 100% sure, but it's just really cool to look at these numbers anyways and kind of talk about them because there is some value in that. Yeah. So giving people some numbers to work with now. I want to start with the first, the point you made there about number of players, right? Because mm -hmm. there was speculation. Why are they increasing it to 600 when they're not increasing the number of regionals? And they, they are increasing the points that you are likely to get from a regional, but it's still just a fixed number of events. And they also decreased the best finish limit to six instead of eight. For cups and challenges so looking at the numbers this season so far people who have recorded at least uh like a couple of cp just like have earned any number of points and i'm pulling this from the play pokemon leaderboards there's 7187 players this year who have recorded any number of championship points um so far and we're only halfway through Compare that to the entirety of the 2019 season, and you have 4,934 players, and that's for the whole season, recording any number of points. So we're almost double that. Technically, it's 46%. We're at a 46% increase in players who have recorded any CP, and that's, you know, it, it's likely to go up because you might have had people who aren't going to join until halfway through the year who have competed in a couple of events, but haven't gotten CP yet. So it's not an exact player count, but it's a good directional. So Jake, any thoughts on the, the player count numbers there for people who've recorded CP? It's just like, there's just a lot of people that are getting into the game. And I feel like as well, like with events and stuff like that, like we, there's a lot that's, going on and i think there's a lot of people interested but also there's a lot of opportunities to get it you know we talk about the especially the major events right one of the things that we said is like you can only get points and stuff like really value from these major events either if you win or if you go to every single one right but now you can get not even the top 50 percent of players and you can register points at these events so it, it Although, you know, getting, you know, top uh, 10, 28 or whatever the number is, I don't know, at a regional and only getting like five CP or, or whatever it is exactly, it still might be farther away, uh, still far away from the 600 that you need to qualify in terms of NA Masters. But it's just, it's, it's crazy to see like where we've come and how the landscape has changed and evolved. And especially like where like, everybody felt gut reaction when it first started to where we are now, where I don't see anybody complain about it now. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll be, for me, it'll be interesting. It's clear that way more people are playing, even if more people are getting CP. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine anyone would have expected in like 2019, the equivalent would have been like Dallas regionals, which yeah, it's an expanded at the time, but assume it was standard. Um, <laughs> Like, nobody would have expected nearly 2,000 players in 2019 at any regional other than, and even NAIC, I don't even know if, pulled, if it pulled 2,000. So, mm. clearly, there's way more people playing. So, uh, but it's not just from the regionals. Like, you know, locals, I'm sure there are more people playing in local, you know, challenges and cups. So, I think Pokemon was correct in, in understanding the vast increase in the number of players and they adjusted the points total to reflect that so then my other question jake do you think that because there have been so many more people i know we talked about this earlier so this is but what would you have expected do you think that because so many more people are playing that we are on pace to have that many more people earning a spot in worlds i Here's what I think. I think when you talk about something like this, I think that there's a teeter off, right? Because mm. right out of the gate, people are excited 
right? Uh, new championship season, new new set released, I think, right? Um, yeah. The season started with a new set. So, like, more people are going to go to locals and stuff. And so, as time continues on, right, as we continue throughout the season, there are more and more people that count those, uh, especially locals, cups and challenges with championship points. There are more people, or there, I'm sorry, and there are less people that, you know, get their points for the first time in the season. So I don't know if we'll have the same amount of people, you know, like, I don't, I don't think we're exactly going to hold the pace per se, but I do think it's still, I do think it's still going to be strong. I mean, we've talked about how the Pokemon training card game in general, you know, like social, the social media team has been really working. It feels like uh, within the last year, I feel like on Twitter, I see them putting stuff out all the time now and a variety of stuff, you know, interacting more with the public and things like that. And we see these products that get announced and, you know, the game of the years, you know, battle Academy, stuff like that, different ways to get people into uh, the game in general, instead of just, uh, collecting, which there's nothing wrong if you just collect. Um, and so, like, I think we'll see this continual growth, but definitely, like, I don't know if we'll hit the number, well, but we'll definitely get a number that I think will surprise people in terms of how many people qualify, you know, once we get to the end. I think a lot of people's gut reaction of, oh, this is terrible, whatever. I think a lot of people will have different feelings about it. So I'll put it in firm numbers. 212 mm-hmm. people qualified for Worlds in 2019 from the U.S. and Canada. And my question to you is, how many people do you think, and we can make a prediction now, how many people do you, would, you have ex- would you expect to qualify for Worlds this year from the U.S. and Canada? Do you know how many people have at least 300 right now? I do. I have that exact number. What's the exact number? Oh, I I, want to know what you think, given the number of people playing. No, no, no. no. Like with the the number right now, I'll tell you this. The number right now. I'm basing my world championship qualifiers with how many people have at least 300. So 286 players are halfway to their world's invite. So if 286, I'm going to say probably my number is going to be 134 world's qualifiers. Oh, so you think it will go down? Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. Okay. I, I do agree that it is definitely harder to get yeah. right. I do think, and we talked about this before, like, I think it should be difficult to get to the world championships, right? To earn your invite as someone that's come from like a sports background, I feel like it should be very difficult, you know, to get to the world championships. And I do think Pokemon's intention is to get less people at the world championships. You know, we look at other card games where like Magic only has eight players at the world championships overall, right? That get that qualification. So I do think the number is going to be lower, but I don't think people are going to be, I don't think it's going to like, really affect people's emotions of like oh man this sucks or oh it's too difficult because there's still more opportunities to get cp and prizing in general right i think top 32 now gets money at a regional championships which is crazy right but really really cool um and deserving as well so this is uh, sorry i i I love crunching numbers i crunch some more numbers Mm -hmm. Of the people who received any points, any CP in 2019, so this is not everyone who competed, but just people who received some points, 4%, there was a 4% conversion rate uh, of people who qualified for Worlds. So only 4% Mm -hmm. of people who received any points qualified for Worlds of people who received points. So Mm -hmm. 134, I, you know, you you might be onto something with regard to i do we don't know how many of those people of those 286 have maxed out or are near maxing maxing out their um locals and i points. would assume that it's probably it's probably coming close right i mean if you're mm. 
if you're serious, if you have over a hundred points right now, I feel like you've either done really well at a regional like one time, right? Or you've competed in a ton of local events. And what do you remember off the top of your head what the what the max point total was for cups and challenges? Like three hundred and ninety. Three hundred and ninety. So I feel yeah. like if you're I feel like if you're over one hundred, you're probably some sort of a local grinder. Um not saying that that's a bad term or anything, but you're probably someone that plays at a lot of locals. Um, and whether it's just one spot, you know, you compete every single month at that locals um, and you show up to all the cups and challenges at that one spot, or maybe you live in a city like Las Vegas or Indianapolis um, or something like that, where there's several different places around that have that. Okay. My, my gut, I'll tell you my feeling. I think we're going to end up mm-hmm. with, I think people are actually um, gonna, the people who are close are going to double down on trying to get those regionals points. And I don't know if that means that people will, that will see less attendance at regionals, but I think we will see a lot more concerted attendance at regionals for those players. Like people may dip into the piggy bank more than they were expecting if they have had a decent season and have a good shot at doing it. I actually think we're going to have, my gut says 350 players going to Worlds, Mm -hmm. which is an increase. Okay. But I don't think that it's, given the number of overall players growing, I actually don't think it is that as much of an increase as if we'd kept the old. I think if we'd kept the old rule, I think we might have had like 500 players making it to Worlds, which is probably too many. We would have had way, way higher. Yeah. We would have had way higher. So that's that's so, so 134 from you and then 350 from me. I don't know where we should tweet that or pin that or what, but well, I, I, I want to put it in our group chat. Yeah, I put it in our okay. little group chat here and I'll pin it. Excellent. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I want y'all at home, listeners, um, shout at us. What do you think? Is it like you've heard some of the numbers now? You see where we're pacing and all of that. Give us your predictions. Where do you think we're going to end up? Also, just tell us, is the 600... I know for a lot of our listeners, probably they're not even going for Worlds. They don't care. I know I don't. Mm-hmm. I, I pay attention, but I don't, I don't care. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we love talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great to talk about it. But yeah, let us know your thoughts too. It'd be dope. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it's wrapping us up. <laughs> I think that's all. Next week will be our Christmas slash New Year's uh, edition of the podcast. We will have an episode that comes out on the Tuesday as regularly scheduled. So after the holidays, you know, if you want to, uh, you want to wind down, maybe you're doing some travel and want to listen to the car. We will have a regularly scheduled podcast for you all. Um, and it's a cool one. Sean and I have talked a little bit about it and, um, I'll have to talk a little bit more and think a little bit more, um, <laughs> in the coming days now that I'm not traveling or whatever. So, uh, it's, it's, it's a really fun one. Anyway. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the MetaPod Podcast. The MetaPod Podcast revolves around the evolving meta. I'm Jake, that's Sean, and uh, we'll see you for episode 169.